Hey guys, I am going to continue reading where we left off on chapter 6. Sorry, my puppy's crazy, so I might have to stop a few times. Um, but I'm on the bottom, the very last sentence on page 92. But in spite of this great love, he bore John Thornton, which seemed to bespeak the soft, civilizing influence. The strain of the primitive, which the Northland had aroused in him, remained alive and active. So although Buck really loves John Thornton, there's, um, he still has this call um, for the wild. And so he, he likes that. He likes that feeling of being in the wild, but he's also really enjoying the love that he feels um, with John Thornton. So it's kind of like that internal struggle that Buck has right now. Faithfulness and devotion, things born of fire and roof, were his. Yet he retained his wildness and wellness. He was a thing of the wild, come in from the wild to sit by John Thornton's fire, rather than a dog of the south, soft Southland stamped with the marks of generation of civilization. Because of his very great love, he could not steal from this man. But from any man in any other camp, he did not hesitate an instant while the cunning with which he stole enabled him to escape detection. His face and body were both scored by the teeth of many dogs, and he fought as fiercely as ever and more shrewdly. Skeet and Nig were too good-natured for quarreling. Besides, they belonged to John Thornton. But the strange dog, no matter what the breed or valour, swiftly acknowledged Buck's supremacy or found himself struggling for life with a terrible antagonist. So basically Buck didn't mind um, fighting any other dog, but he left Skeet and, Nick al Skeet and Nig alone because they belonged to John Thornton and they were playful and loving dogs. There was no competition. They got along really, really well. Um, but every other dog that Buck encountered was afraid of Buck and Buck was merciless. He had learned well the law of club and fang, and he never forewent an advantage or drew back from a foe. He had started on the way to death. He had lessened from Spitz and from the chief fighting dogs of the police and mail, and knew there was no middle course. He must master or be mastered. I would use that if you're doing survival and death, because Buck learned either he has to be the master of the other dogs or he would be mastered. And in some cases, it's kind of like kill or be killed. While to show mercy was a weakness. Mercy did not exist in the primordial life. It was misunderstood for fear. And such misunderstandings made for death. Underline that, use that quote. Kill or be killed, eat or be eaten was the law. And this mandate down out of the depths of time he obeyed. He was older than the days he had seen and the breaths he had drawn. He linked the past with the present and the eternity behind him throbbed through him in a mighty rhythm to which he swayed as the tides and seasons swayed. He sat by John Thornton's fire, a broad-breasted dog, white-fanged and long-furred, but behind him were the shades of all manner of dogs, half-wolves and wild wolves, urgent and prompting, tasting the savor of the meat he ate, thirsting for the water he drank, scenting the wind with him, listening with him and telling him the sounds made by the wildlife in the forest, dictating the moods, directing these actions, lying down to sleep with him when he lay down, and dreaming with him and beyond him and becoming themselves the stuff of his dreams. So peremptorily did these shades beckon him that each day mankind and the claims of mankind slipped further from him. Deep in the forest, a call was sounding, and as often as he heard this call, mysteriously thrilling and luring, 
he felt compelled to turn his back upon the fire and the beaten earth around it and to plunge into the forest. And on and on he knew not why or where, nor did he wonder where or why, the call sounding imperiously deep in the forest. But as often as he gained the soft unbroken earth and the green shade, the love for John Thornton drew him back to the fire again. I'm on the top of page 95. And let me just tell you what that whole thing was. So Buck will be sitting around the fire at night with John Thornton and Skeet and Nig. And then he gets this sudden urge that he needs to be out running in the wild. And so he'll go and he'll go and he'll roam and he'll, you know, wander through the woods and the forest. And then he remembers John Thornton and he comes back to camp. Okay. So he likes the primordial life, but he also has this call to go into the wild. Okay. And he's struggling between like these two little lives. Thornton alone held him. The rest of mankind was as nothing. Chance travelers might praise or pet him, but he was cold under it all. And from a too demonstrative man, he would get up and walk away. When Thornton's partners, Hans and Pete, um, you can underline those two names, arrived on the long expected raft, Buck refused to notice them till he learned they were close to Thornton. After he tolerated them in a passive sort of way, accepting favors from them as though he favored them by accepting. They were of the same large type as Thornton, living close to the earth, thinking simply and seeing clearly, and ere they swung the raft into the bid eddy by the sawmill at Dawson. They understood Buck and his ways and did not insist upon an intimacy such as obtained with Skeet and Nig. For Thornton, however, his love seemed to grow and grow. He, alone among men, could put a pack upon Buck's back in the summer traveling. Nothing was too great for Buck to do when Thornton commanded. One day... They had grub stocked themselves from the proceeds of the raft and left Dawson for the headwaters of the Tanana. The men and the dogs were sitting on the crest of a cliff which fell away straight down to naked bedrock 300 feet below. John Thornton was sitting near the edge, Buck at his shoulder. A thoughtless whim seized Thornton and he drew the attention of Hans and Pete to the experiment. He had in mind, jump buck, he commanded, sweeping his arm out and over the chasm. The next instant, he was grappling with buck on the extreme edge while Hans and Pete were dragging them back into safety. It's uncanny, Pete said. After it was over and they caught their speech, Thornton shook his head. No, it is splendid. And it is terrible, too. Do you know, it sometimes makes me afraid. I'm not hankering to be the man that lays hands on you while he's around, Pete announced conclusively, nodding his head toward Buck. So basically, John Thornton can ask Buck to do anything, and Buck loves John so much that he'll do it. He literally almost just went over a cliff because John Thornton told him to. And so Hans and Pete are like, um, if anybody ever tries to hurt you, John Thornton, that dog is going to be so protective. We don't want to be around if somebody ever tries to mess with you because Buck will probably tear him apart. Let me get my dog. Sadie, come here. She's trying to chew some things in my... Come here, Sade. <whistles> yep. Say hi. She's chewing everything. She's such a puppy. Okay, here we go. Page 96. By Jingo was Hans's contribution, not mine self either. It was the Circle City ere the year was out that Pete's apprehensions were realized. Black Burton... A man, evil-tempered and malicious, 
had been picking a quarrel with a tender foot at the bar when Thornton stepped good-naturedly between. Buck was with his custom, was lying in a corner, head on paws, watching his master's every action. Burton struck out without warning, straight from the shoulder. Thornton was sent spinning and saved himself from falling only by clutching the rail of the bar. Those who were looking on heard what was neither bark nor yelp, but something which is best described as a roar, and they saw Buck rise up in the air as he left the floor for Burton's throat. The man saved his life by instinctively throwing out his arm, but was hurled backward to the floor with Buck on top of him. So Buck saw this big um, Burton guy um, kind of go at John Thornton and that quickly Buck leaped up off the floor and went right for Burton's jugular. Remember like Buck knows how to attack and so he knows to go for the kill which is to go at someone's throat. So he was defending John Thornton. Buck loosened his teeth from the flesh of the arm and drove in again for the throat. I'm at the top of page 97. This time the man seceded only in partly blocking and his throat was torn open. Ugh. Then the crowd was upon Buck and he was driven off. But while a surgeon checked the bleeding, he prowled up and down growling furiously, attempting to rush in and being forced back by an array of hostile clubs. A miners' meeting called on the spot decided that the dog had sufficient provocation and Buck was discharged. Buck didn't get in trouble because he felt like everybody felt like he was just defending his owner. But his reputation was made, and from that day, his name spread through every camp in Alaska. Later on in the fall of the year, he saved John Thornton's life in quite another fashion. The three partners were lining a long and narrow pulling boat down a bad stretch of rapids on the 40 mile creek. Hans and Pete moved along the bank, snubbing with a thin manila rope from a tree to tr oh, from tree to tree, while Thornton remained in the boat, helping the descent by means of a pole. Sorry, my dog has something again. Okay, she's good. <laughs> and shouting directions to the shore. Buck on the bank, worried and anxious, kept abreast of the boat, his eyes never off his master. At a particularly bad spot where a ledge of barely submerging rocks jutted out into the river, Hans cast off the rope, and while Thornton pulled the boat out into the stream, ran down the bank with the end in his hand to snub the boat when it had cleared the ledge. This it did, and was flying downstream in a current as swift as a mill race. When Hans checked it with the rope and checked too, suddenly the boat flirted over and snubbed into the bank bottom, up while Thornton flung sheer out of it was carried downstream toward the worst part of the rapids, a stretch of wild water in which no swimmer could live. So Thornton is now in this dangerous water. Buck had sprung in on the instant, and at the end of the 300 yards, amid a mad swirl of water, he overhauled Thornton. When he felt him grasp his tail, Buck headed for the bank swimming with all his splendid strength. But the progress showward was slow. The progress downstream was amazingly rapid. From below came the fatal roaring where the wild current went wilder and was rent in shreds and spray by the rocks which thrust through the teeth of the enormous comb. The sunk of the water as it took the beginning of the last steep pitch was frightful, and Thornton knew that the shore was impossible. He scraped furiously over a rock, bruised across a second, and struck a third with crushing force. 
he clutched its slippery top with both hands, releasing Buck, and above the roar of the churning water shouted, Go, Buck, go! Buck could not hold his own and swept on downstream, struggling desperately, but unable to win back. When he heard Thornton's command repeated, he partly reared out of the water, throwing his head high as though for a last look, then turned obediently toward the bank. He swam powerfully, was dragged ashore by Pete and Hans at the very point where swimming ceased to be possible and destruction began. They knew that the time a man could cling to a slippery rock in the face of that driving current was a matter of minutes, and they ran as fast as they could up the bank to a point far above where Thornton was hanging on. They attached the line with which they had been snubbing the boat to Buck's neck and shoulders, being careful that it should neither strangle him nor impede his swimming, and launched him into the stream. He struck out boldly, but not straight enough into the stream. He discovered that mistake too late, when Thornton was abreast of him and a bare half dozen strokes away while he was being carried helplessly past. Hans promptly snubbed with the rope as though Buck were a boat, the rope thus tightening on him as he sweep of the in the sweep of the current. He was jerked under the surface, and under the surface he remained till his body struck against the bank and he was hauled out. He was half drowned, so that could be death, like Buck is almost drowned to death trying to save John Thornton from this dangerous water. And Hans and Pete threw themselves upon him, pounding the breath into him and the water out of him. So they're trying to get the water out of his lungs. He staggered, top of page 100, to his feet and fell down. The faint sound of Thornton's voice came to them and though they could not make out the words of it, they knew that he was in his extremity. His master's voice acted on Buck like an electric shock. He sprang to his feet and ran up the bank ahead of the men to the point of this previous departure. I'm going to pause there.